Hi, my name is Michael Courcy. I'm a solution architect at Cast and Bivy. And today I'm going to show you how to use CSI snapshot for backing up your application. So we'll see different things. The first thing that we're going to explore is why do we need snapshot to make a good backup rather than a file system copy. Then we'll see what is the container storage interface. Then we're going to use this part of the CSI called the, the, the snapshot part to take a backup of your whole namespace. And to finish, we'll see the limitation of the solution that we're going to demonstrate for the long term protection. Why do we need snapshot rather than file system copy to take good backup? The reason is simple. Let's take a Let's take a PVC with six files. At T0, F1 has four banana, F6 has four pineapple. At T1, five. At T2, six. Then you take a snapshot. And the snapshot is crash consistent, which means all the files are captured exactly in the same time. So you capture the six banana and you capture also the six pineapple. All that in the same time, consistent with the actual file system state before the crash. If you do a file system copy, you copy each file one by one while the system is still evolving. So you may find yourself at the moment of the backup taking the six banana, but when you finish the copy, you finish with F6 with eight pineapples and you are not in the real actual state of the file system before the crash. So you're not crash consistent. It's why you need to use snapshot to take good backup. But snapshot is crash consistent, but not application consistent. So what does it mean? Let's take an example of an application like Kafka. Kafka is about managing messages. It's made of topic. Topic are made of partitions. Partitions are made of segments. And segments are the files in which you write the Kafka message. To get a very high throughput, Kafka is not writing immediately the message to the file system. It actually uses the OS virtual memory to open the file. And when you write, when Kafka writes a message, it actually writes it in the RAM, in the memory, not in the file system. It's only when some of the conditions are made, like size is rich or the timeout is rich, that Kafka takes the decision to flush the file. And then the file is, and then the message are really written to the file system. But what happens if the snapshot happen before the flush, then your segment is not in the backup. So you may find yourself in a situation where some of the partition has all the segment and some of the partition does not have all the segment. And in the point of view of Kafka, this is not consistent. It's why we say that snapshots are crash consistent, but not application consistent. As a quick takeaway, let's say that it's better to use snapshot than file system copy unless you are able to freeze. In this case, your file system backup will be crash consistent. And snapshot is crash consistent, but not necessarily application consistent, unless you have a mechanism to flush before taking the snapshot. To understand why we needed the container storage interface in Kubernetes, we need to understand how work dynamic storage provisioning. When the user submit a PVC, Kubernetes API translate this PVC request to the driver. And the driver on its turn is going to speak to the storage provider to create a volume. And in turn, you get a PV 
in the update of the PVC. What is important to understand here is this part that we call the driver is belonging to the Kubernetes code. But this part that we call the storage provider is not belonging to Kubernetes. This part could be EBS, could be Azure Disk, safe. Many, many storage providers, not so many as we're going to see in the, in the previous version before the CSI. And now when you need to attach a pod to your PV, you submit the pod plus the PVC request, and it's also the job of the driver to work on the node, to attach the PV to the node where the pod is scheduled, which in turn will return in a moon status and translate to a pod status. So the issue here was this part, the driver. The driver belonged to the Kubernetes code. And for this reason, it was a limited number of drivers. You can see this limited number of drivers here. They are all represented here, actually. That's all. And that's an issue because let's say you are NetApp and you want to communicate with Kubernetes. You want to let your customer be able to create NetApp volume for their Kubernetes workload. The only solution the NetApp team has at this moment was to submit her code to the Kubernetes team. And the Kubernetes team has to accept the code. Then if you have a bug in your driver, you need to wait for the next Kubernetes release. So your, your uh, release cycle of your driver is tied to the release cycle of Kubernetes. And for all these reasons, that was an issue. It's why the Kubernetes team created the CSI, the Container Storage Interface. CSI lets you introduce your storage driver without depending on the Kubernetes code. It defines a specific set of interfaces that you must respect to communicate between Kubernetes and your driver. First, your driver register declares its capabilities, and then it will be able to handle all the PVC requests. Now, how does it turn? First, you register to the Kubernetes API. And now, when a PVC that you should handle is submitted by the user, the provisioner capture it and submit it to what we call the CSI endpoint. But the CSI endpoint basically is what was the driver before. And you follow the previous path and you translate that in a create volume response. So all these parts are generic, belonging to the CSI. Then in turn, you get a PV updated at the PVC level. And when you submit uh, an attachment, it's translated to a published volume request, which follow the previous path that we show. And at the end, you get a pod status. So you're back in the previous situation, but this part in blue could be broke dynamically by any storage provider that want to be able to work with Kubernetes. So let's take a very simple example. You see here, I bring the stateful set representing the, the deployment of the CSI host path. And of course, I remove a lot of code to just get the things I wanted to show you. First, you have this, this sidecar called OSPATH plugin. This one is basically the driver. Then you have the provisioner. So the provisioner is the one who has to translate the PVC request to the driver. You have also the registrar. I should have spoken about it in the first place, which register this kind of storage to the Kubernetes API. You have the CSI attacher, which is responsible for the not published volume. So when you want to mount a, a PVC to a pod. And you have two other snapshots that belong also to the CSI API, which is the snapshotter and the resizer. We're not going to speak about the resizer, but we're going to speak about the snapshotter. 
a quick takeaway. CSI let any storage vendor register to Kubernetes. CSI decouple storage vendor code to Kubernetes code. And most of the sidecars for communicating with Kubernetes can be reused with little configuration change. Only the CSI endpoint, which is the driver, is the storage vendor responsibility. To create a snap of your volume, you create a volume snapshot object. The volume snapshot object is a namespaced object and is made of two things. First, the source, which is the PVC that you want to snap, and the snapshot class name, because you may have more than one CSI driver in your cluster and you want to address the snapshot request to the proper driver. When you create this object, it will trigger the creation of another object called the volume snapshot content. And it's the volume snapshot content creation that will trigger the real snap on the storage layer. Now, if you want to restore from a snap, you create a regular persistent volume claim, but this time, you specify the data source as the snapshot that you just created. And once again, you specify the proper storage class name in order to use the proper driver for the restoration. And that will create a clone of the snap, a clone of the PVC when the snap was created. To summarize that in a diagram, I created this small graph. Here is the, sap, the volume snapshot, which is a namespaced object. And when you create it, it triggers the creation of a volume snapshot content. And it's the volume snapshot content that will be responsible for the uh, creation of the snap. Or the driver is going to take the actual volume and do the snap to the storage layer. Here it's EBS. It's interesting to note that the, the link to the actual snap is not at the volume snapshot level, but at the volume snapshot content level. And inside the volume snapshot content level, you, you, you're going to have a small attribute called volume snapshot handle that will point to the actual snap. Here you have the retention policy delete. So this policy means that if you delete the volume snapshot, it will cascade the deletion of the volume snapshot content, which in turn will cascade the deletion of the actual snap. If you choose written instead of delete, the deletion of the volume snapshot content won't delete the actual snap on the storage layer. And your actual snap is going to be here for as long as you delete it manually at the storage layer level. If I want to restore, or if I want to clone a PVC from a namespace, MySQL, to another namespace, MySQL restored, here is how I can do. I can create a volume snapshot of my PVC, MySQL, which will trigger a volume snapshot content pointing to this actual snap. And to, to restore it, I create another volume snapshot content pointing to the same volume snapshot handle. And I create a volume snapshot in my namespace, the MySQL restore. And from this snapshot, I create a clone. And here I am. I have my new PVC with exactly the same data than the PVC that I had originally on MySQL. Interesting to note here that I put retention policy delete and here, retention policy written. Why that? It's because my initial action was to create a snap here. And I want to keep the control of the deletion of that. So if for any reason I decide to remove the namespace, for example, if I remove the namespace MySQL restore it, what will happen? It will delete the volume snapshot. And if here it's not written but delete, then it will trigger by cascading the deletion of the volume snapshot content and the EBS. And the left chain here will finish with something that does not exist anymore. 
So when I clone from an M-space to another one, I always put retention policy here, written, so that the deletion of this namespace does not accidentally delete the original snap. Now, if I want to simply snap a wall namespace, it's actually very easy now with the uh, CSI API. I take the namespace and the snapshot class as an argument, and for all the PVC in my namespace, I create the corresponding snapshot. And here I am. I have all my PVC in my namespace snapshotted. It's interesting to note here that I don't use any kind of secret to speak to the storage layer. I don't have to provide my Azure secret or my AWS access key with the proper right to create or delete volumes. All that is not my preoccupation now. I just have to work with API. As a quick takeaway, CSI let you create snapshot with Kubernetes API. And any application that want to manage backup don't need anymore to have all the secrets of your storage layer. However, you must take some precaution because it becomes very, very easy to delete accidentally the data because you just have to delete the API. There is limitation to the solution I propose. Uh, some obvious limitation. The first one that I already discussed is the fact that Snap is not application consistent as I show it uh, in the Kafka example. The second thing is Snap are not durable backup. Chance is that if you have a disaster, your Snap will be included in the disaster. And you need a way to extract your Snap to make them durable backup. Um, the first approach would be to, 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 to take a clone. And from the clone, you upload the clone to the S3 bucket in another region, in another place, in another infrastructure. Another approach could be to replicate the Snap to different regions or to different infrastructure, if that's possible. Next thing is the backup policies. You don't want to just punctually backup your project. You want to do regular backup to have a RTO. RTO is the recover time objective, which means the time where you lose the data. And you want to reduce that. So you need to take regular backup. And of course, if you take regular backup, it means that you have to clean the backup. Do you have to clean the snap that you created? And that asks the question of the retention policy. The script that I show you does not handle that, of course. When we're working with Kubernetes, we take the application as, as a wall. So we just don't want only the data. We want to have the data plus the deployment, the stateful set, the config, the secret, and so on, even the CRDs. And if we wanted to have a proper backup mechanism, we should not only capture the snap, but also all the configuration and to be able to migrate that to another cluster. So that's something, of course, the solution I show does not handle. And last but not least, API are good, but not for everybody. Some people don't want to work with the API, with the CLI. It's too complicated, or they don't want to learn. And they expect a single uh, pane of glass to, to, to handle all the backup process. You may have also some question about multi-tenancy. How do you uh, handle multi-tenancy on a big cluster? All these questions are, of course, in the limitation of the solution I show, but the tools that, um, that will give you some professional support for your backup will address that. Okay, thanks a lot. And I hope this presentation was helpful. And I just have to say, see you soon in the next KubeCon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.